Okay, guys, welcome to lesson number 151. And this time I wanted to start with a statement and a few questions to make you <laughs> to make you a little bit uncomfortable. The statement, very simple. Regardless of the opening that you're going to learn, you need to learn the theory, middle game plans, but just as important, it is to learn the end games, the typical end games that come out of your opening. And that's exactly why we're having this lesson. I told you some time ago that we're going to start learning the English opening, the Sicilian defense. And before we get into it, we need to guys learn the typical end games. And yes, I like to learn chess backwards. So we learn end games first, middle game, and then of course the theory. Now with that out of the way, let me ask you the questions that I think are going to make you uncomfortable. All I need you to do is take a look at these positions in front of you and think of the plan that you come up with in order to win. I'm not talking about the next move. I'm talking about the plan, long-term plan. And guys, it doesn't matter if you play the Sicilian defense or the English. This is going to be important. Like this position in front of you right now, believe it or not, it did not come out of a Sicilian defense game. This was more a Tory attack. So just for you to see, I've told you so many times, it's very important that you study openings even if you don't like them because you never know when you could use ideas from one into the other. So first position that you have in front of you, this one is going to be particularly useful for when we learn how to play against the, the close Sicilian. Um, this next one, and by the way, feel free to pause the video as many times as you need to go over it. This next one, the same thing, guys, what's going to be your overall plan. And then lastly, let me show you this one, which is the main game that we're going to review, even though it didn't come out of a Sicilian defense game. Okay, now that you actually took the time to come up with the plans, even if you're not familiar with these positions, now that you let me know in the comments uh, what those plans were so that I can plan future lessons, <laughs> I know you didn't do anything, but at least I hope that you actually thought about it, guys. So now that we did that, let's go over these positions and then we're going to finish with that full game that I want to show you. So guys, the first position, this is going to be very classical position from the closed Sicilian. Notice that the black pieces have our fianchetto bishop aiming at the queen side, the typical pawn on c5 from the Sicilian defense. This is indicating to us that we should expand on the queen side. So our move, something like rook c8, even rook b8, trying to open up lines, gain more space, and capitalize on the queen side. For the white pieces, they should be trying to do the same thing in the center and the king side. Now, if we go to this other position, guys, this is the same position we had before, but this is typically what we get when none of the sides get anything out of their plan. So the black pieces couldn't capitalize on the queen side, white pieces couldn't capitalize on the king side, or simply they managed to trade pieces and they got to this position. What do we do in this position that looks more like an end game? Well, your plan, and this is very important, your plan is to open up lines for your rooks to get in and attack. Now, up to this point, all of this should be very basic to you. You should be here like, okay, how is this important? Give me something more. <laughs> give me something better well we're gonna go now guys before we get to the main game let me go to this game played by Karpov as the white pieces against very strong player Anthony Miles and here you could see how the black pieces did the same thing of course uh, notice that we have opposite side castling attack we know that typically we go ahead and try to attack the kings nothing else matters but with the pieces traded we walk into this end game and the black pieces continued to expand. If I show you uh, the last few moves, it's been trying to expand on the queen side. It's not so much to attack the king. And some people ask me, okay, why are they still doing the pawn storm if the queens are off the board? There's, there are no chances of a checkmate. Well, they're just getting ready to open up files and penetrate for that rook endgame. So guys, up to this point, the only thing that I need you to have gotten from these few positions is that in this Sicilian, for the most part, as the black pieces were going to be working on the queen side, especially if you are if you have this uh, setup with the fianchetto, right? Now, if we go to this other position, this, this is another game where Anthony Miles is playing, but he's playing this time as the white pieces, and you're going to see how this very strong player loses the game simply because his opponent knew what to do in the end game. Now, let me go back just to show you this game guys look at this this has nothing to do with the sicilian defense they started with knight f6 knight f3 and then bishop g5 tory attack but after bishop g7 c5 look at that that pawn on c5 is already giving us the pawn structure that we typically get in the sicilian defense so even if you have never learned the sicilian like myself you know that i played the peers the king's indian defense but i still learned 
this uh, study these openings because you never know when you could get into this position. So C5 was played, they take 94. I'm not gonna go here in detail, I just wanna get to the critical position. And after castling and knight c3, trying to get to d5, we got knight c6, queen d2, and then after queen b6, rook b1, taking care of that pawn, queen d4, you're going to see, guys, that the black pieces are just looking for that opportunity. And if you see here, these are the words of Boris Gulko, who played this game as the black pieces. He quickly identified this pattern of the Sicilian endgame, and he went for it. Now, what you're going to see next is exactly what I need you to pay attention to whenever you get into these endgames. So here, after knight d5, it is the black pieces to move, and this is a good moment for you to pause the video. Using the knowledge that we just learned from the first three positions, guys, the next move should be pretty easy for you to find, but I know uh, it's a little bit soon for that. But if you if you pause the video and you guessed the next move here for the black pieces, congrats, because that means you're really getting the hang of this. And the move is simple. Again, look at the semi-open file on the queen side. I know that I'm going to be playing on the queen side. I need to start gaining space as quickly as possible. The white pieces didn't do e4 or e3. Well, I'm going to do b5 right away. And guys, here you can appreciate sort of a minority attack setup. I have two pawns. I'm going to try to attack these three pawns to create weaknesses. And hopefully with my open or semi-open files, I'm going to capitalize on those weaknesses. So after b5, we got uh, pawn to g3, bishop d7, just developing quickly, bishop g2, and then it's time to develop the rooks. Now the question is, where should I put the rooks? Guys, one thing is for sure, one of the rooks is going to go to c8. Now, what rook would you use? Would you use the a rook or the f rook? Well, once more, I'm going to be playing on the queen side. This is a Sicilian endgame. So I want to bring this rook to c8, and then the other rook is going to go to b8. So he starts with rook a to b8, getting away from this diagonal. And then after castling, we're going to go rook f to c8. Now, all of my pieces are in pretty good shape. They're all on the queen side. Now I'm going to start making progress. After pawn to f4, we have king f8, bringing the king to defend the pawn on e7, also getting closer towards the center. Then pawn to e4, and then here, if you look at this pawn on e4, guys, it looks a lot like this started with e4, c5 as the very first move, Sicilian defense, right? Now, for that reason, I want you, again, I know they already looked at this exact position, but take a moment again and think of what you do next. You're playing in a tournament game, you get to this position, we already learned a little bit about the, the Sicilian endgame. What should we do in, at this point? Guys, the next move here, the reason for the next move is something that I learned myself when I went over this game. Here, Boris Golko is asked, why did you play knight a5 instead of playing the move a5, continuing to push those pawns to create weaknesses? Well, he laid out a very important principle that says that we should maximize the position of our pieces before worrying about activating uh, our pawns. So instead of doing pawn first, I could improve my knight and I could bring it to c4 and that's something else. He's saying c4 is a very sensible square for the white pieces in the Sicilian. So knight a5, trying to get to c4. Many times we simply go to e5, c4, but we can't. And that's why if you pay attention to this move, it looked a little bit awkward, but the idea is they didn't want the knight to go to e5. So we have knight a5, c3, and now we go to c4, as simple as that. And then after rookie two, now that our pieces are really powerful, we can think of improving our pawns. However, before we do that, he did take care of the white pieces most powerful piece. What is the most powerful piece for the white pieces? Well, it's definitely not the bishop, definitely not the rook, it's going to be this knight. If we remove that knight, we could claim our pieces are way more powerful, we have a better chance here. So. How do I remove the, the knight? Simple, I'm going to go bishop e6. And if you think about it, this bishop doesn't really have a role in this game so far. So bishop e6, then rook c1, defensive moves, and then we simply take that, that knight. Now, you might be thinking, yeah, I took the knight, but now I opened the file for them. Well, it's not gonna be easy for them to capitalize on that pawn. It's easy to defend, and they're going to be busy taking care of the queen side. So. After e takes d5, pay attention to that bishop, guys. That bishop is just not going to help him in a long time. So again, another critical moment in the game. You Let's say that you've come this far. You thought of activating the knight before the pawn. You, take, you took care of your opponent's most active piece. But then what do I do next? Well, at this point, it's not only important that we focus on our plan, 
But we also need to pay attention to what our opponent is trying to do. We need to be prophylactic. And one idea that the white pieces have in mind is to do B3, right? So how do we take care of that? Well, we have learned, we have said it so many times, every time a pawn is moved in, in chess, weaknesses are created. So B3 is going to happen. C3 is going to become weaker. So rook C5 is going to be our move. Now, if they do B3, well, we simply go back and then we're going to have so many pieces putting pressure on C3. This pawn, this move that we did a long time ago is fixing the pawn on C3. And of course, we're putting pressure on D5. So instead of B3, they did King F2. Now, pawn to A5, finally, when our pieces are so active, we start pushing the pawn. And this is simply, guys, to do pawn to B4. Minority attack, trying to create targets to collect afterwards. So rook c2, so passive, so painful. I have been here myself. Uh, I know how it feels. So knight b6, just trying to put pressure on the pawn. And at the, at the right time, guys, I want to do b4, right? So now we got a3. We shouldn't take the pawn because then b4 could be really, really uncomfortable. So instead, we continue to add more pressure. So rook d1, pawn to b4. Finally, we strike and this pawn is going to be traded on c3 at the right time to leave that pawn left behind and it's going to be a very nice target to try to capitalize on. So at this point, we have rook d3. Look, all of those rooks are just defending a little pawn. My rooks, pretty powerful. My knight is completely, is way better than this bishop. This is very comfortable, comfortable to play. Still, you don't know how many times I've been in positions like this and I just blow it. I either get a draw or simply make a tactical mistake and lose the game. So we have to be very, very careful. Now, this is another good point for you guys to post a video and think of how to make progress next. And this is what happens to me. We talked about the principle of the second weakness where we find a weakness, we drill on it, our opponent defends it because it's only one weakness, and then the game just goes to a draw. Well, something that Golko says in this game is that the difference between a an elite player and the rest of us <laughs> is that it's hard for us guys to think of changing plans, right? So here we're focused on that pawn. And if you remember what I told you on the first two or three positions, I told you the black pieces are trying to look for open files to penetrate and put pressure. Well, here we have two semi-open files. Well, one semi-open file, one open file. Let's use it. And that's why you see now rook a5. Trying to go now to the b2 pawn. And this is going to be the other weakness that we're going to go after. So uh, rook goes back to d2, pawn to b3, and then rook to a2. Just looking for those uh, targets for, for us to put pressure. So after rook a2, bishop f1. Finally, the bishop is tired of looking at that pawn and it looks for a better diagonal. But now after knight a4, that pawn is going to be mine. Not only am I attacking the pawn, but if they did something like this, well, I'm going to take on c3 and give me the rook, right, if they take. So they had no choice but to let me take the pawn. And now we walk into this end game where we're going to be just better. This last part, I'm going to show it to you guys because there's one last uh, piece of, of advice or a resource that I want you to get comfortable with. Look, we have 94, they take, we take on c3. This pawn is going to be mine, right? So rook c5, give me the pawn. And of course, my king not only is defending, is getting active, centralized. So after g4, we finally get the pawn, g5, king e6, bishop takes. By the way, if you thought of uh, bishop h3, not a big deal. We just go f5 and we should be fine, okay? So instead, we got bishop d5 trying to get into these rook endgames that we know could be tricky. I'm not going to go in detail because we had a very good lesson on 10 rules that apply to rook endgames. If you know that, this should be easy, guys, for you to finish. We have a, a pass pawn. It should be extremely easy. Now, the only reason why I'm showing you this is because at this point, after king f2, the black pieces realized that their opponent could have one piece of counterplay, and that counterplay is going to be the h pawn. Now, this is something that I didn't know, and it's something that is hard to come up in your game unless you've seen it before. And the way to handle it is very simple. You could do h6 or h5. In this game, they did h6, offering the pawn for free, knowing that we're going to collect it right after. Guys, if we didn't do this, they're going to come over to h8. You're going to lose the pawn. They could get, again, some counterplay. So h6 was a very nice move. Then rook h5, and that pawn is going to be mine. Now, let me show you. They did rook h8. Now we take the pawn, king g3, rook h1. And at this point, after king f6, 
the white pieces resign. Again, pass pawn should be easy, but I want to show you how do we actually get that pawn because I know a lot of my students are always, when I show them this game, they're like, okay, 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 but if I'm playing this, I can see myself blowing it and this pawn could even promote, right? Well, all you need to do is do g5 at the right time, collect that pawn, and then king and rook collect this pawn. So it would be something like this. Let's say they go king g4, I push my pass pawn, either the rook or the king have to go after it. If the rook goes, well, give me the pawn. If the king goes, well, I'm going to simply find the right timing to do g5 and then give me the pawn. If they go after my f7 pawn, well, I'm going to go back. I do not want to trade one of my connected pawns for one of the isolated pawns, right? So instead, I want to get that pawn for free. They go back. Now, king g6, and that pawn is going to be mine. So guys, I hope that you found this lesson useful. Next lesson, we're going to start learning about the English opening. Soon after, we're going to continue deeper with the Sicilian defense, and we're gonna try to do it like we did with the with the peers, the King Sicilian defense. And hopefully, by the time that we're done with it, you're going to know not only the theory, but the middle game plans and the end game plans. If you like this lesson, let me know in the comments what you think about learning end games every time we learn a new opening. If you don't think it's necessary, I'm not even going to bother to do it for future openings. But again, I'm always looking for your feedback to plan future lessons. With that said, I will see you on lesson number 152.